City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday night, you're on here with Comp Center, which is me, Drew Breezy. We're going to talk about serious stuff in a lighthearted way. Drew, what's going on with you? Oh, I don't know. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. And uh, I would like to say a huge welcome to someone who just said that they were new in here. Alicia Beatty, look at her, new and She shiny. said you had a big brain earlier, so I'm looking to impress her tonight. Yeah, of course. I would hope. So um, <clears throat> how about this? Uh, let's talk a little bit about some news that's that's kind of breaking right now that's going on that I think is kind of important and relevant uh, in the first responder industry. We'll go to a couple of voicemails. If you want to talk to us tonight, and I don't blame you if you do, our number is 848-COM-911. That's our non-emergency line. 848-COM-911. That's 848-266-6911. Uh, what I would like for you to do is uh, call us so we can just have a general discussion about whatever you want to talk about tonight. Uh, we have a very interesting topic. Uh, in my opinion, we're just going to objectively break down the Paul Pelosi 911 call for the 911 side, for the dispatcher side, and then we're going to break down the body-worn camera for the officer side. Um, I would like for you to respond in the chat with a number one if you like John's beard and I would like for you to in the chat respond with a number one, if you dislike John's beard as well. So I'm going to read you a story. It's called man killed by Memphis police and library had shot off at their officers authority say, so this is breaking. This is tonight. And we know what's going on in Memphis. It's a very hot spot. It's a very serious situation with the Memphis police department because of the killing of Tyree Nichols, the inex inexcusable, in my opinion, beating of Tyree Nichols. Um, and so the, the department is reeling and they're trying to establish or reestablish uh, legitimacy within the community. And, and when you don't, sometimes uh, it can mean, um, that lives are at stake, whether they're citizens or officers alike. So unfortunately tonight, uh, the officer was uh, taken to the hospital in an extremely critical condition. The department said, and the Memphis police have been under intense scrutiny since the death of Tyree Nichols. We all know that. So today a Memphis police officer shot and killed a man in a public library on, uh, after the man shot another officer, critically wounding him, the authority said. The uh, Memphis PD, which is under intense scrutiny after the beating that uh, led to the death of Tyree Nichols last month, said that the man who was shot was pronounced dead at the scene. The officer was taken to the hospital in what's labeled extremely critical condition. Uh, Kelly McAllister is a spokesperson for the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Uh, they were called in to investigate the shooting. Uh, they said that they responded to a report of the man trespassing at the Poplar White Station Library around noon. The same man got into a confrontation with somebody else inside about 30 minutes later. And uh, when the police tried to talk to him, he pulled out a gun and shot an officer. A second police officer then fatally shot the man. Uh, Ms. McAllister said that both officers, as well as the man whom the police killed, were black men. Uh, that made it into the New York Times article, so obviously it's important to them. But um, I, I get it. It's uh, time for – it's racial tension season, and it's time to amp that up. Uh, God rest uh, this uh, – or, or let's pray for this officer that um, he makes the recovery. The gentleman – or the, the guy, not the gentleman, the guy that shot him, Brad Winchester um, – Oh, I'm sorry. This is just a witness. Brad Winchester, a regular at the Poplar White Station Library, said it was quiet at the branch when he arrived a little after noon with only about five patrons and the library staff inside. And when he walked in, Mr. Winchester said he noticed two police officers near the library's computer bank questioning a man he had never seen before. He said, I made it around to the area where I read my books. 
I'd gotten two pages into the book and the, the shooting started. Just imagine the, the trauma that guy went through. He said he heard several shots and dragged a female patron behind a bookcase to hide her from the gunfire. And when he looked up, he saw a police officer wounded on the ground with another officer trying to help him. Uh, the officer was laying face up. The other officer was trying to administer aid. Uh, and you could visibly see blood. Uh, w w is this a sign of the times? I mean, uh, you know, you go to the library to just kind of chill out and, and relax and, and read a book and you get two pages into it and a guy pulls out a gun and shoots to kill a police officer and is subsequently shot and killed himself. The only thing, the only other thing I, s I see of note in here is that, uh, one of the witnesses reported that the man was lying in an area beyond the library's metal detectors. So they had metal detectors even, and the guy made a pass there. So that's what's going on in Memphis, in case you didn't know. Often just for show, those metal detectors, you know, they, they need maintenance, they need calibration, and I'm not sure that anyone at the city is really down for that. I'm sure they were mandated at some point, and now nobody's taking care of it. Sad not case. That, that would have helped. I mean, the, the alarms would have beeped, and you would have been like, oh, you, do you have, you have metal on you? And then the guy would have drawn out his gun. and you know, the gigs up anyway, probably. Uh, or he would have taken off his watch and his belt. And when the thing triggered a third or fourth time, they would have just said, look, just, just come through, uh, as has happened in the past. So <clears throat> how's everybody doing tonight? I see a very active chat. Uh, I'm happy to see Andrea up late in here. I see Jason Keefe, uh, Chief Keefe is in here. Just as a reminder, 848-COM-911, uh, that's 848-266-6911, that's the number to call us. You can, you can call us during the week when you're bored on your shift, on the midnight shift, or whatever you're doing, and leave us a, a voicemail. We happen to have a couple of voicemails ready for you. Uh, we have some entertaining stories in the voicemails, so here are the voicemail chronicles. So I got a little story for you. When I was going back to school, uh, go get a, you know, uh, a degree later in life to alter some career path. I was moonlighting, working as a manager for a security company. And it's Canada. So that was a cool story. Trespass notices, all that silly stuff. Are you not hearing it? Do. Come through the one manager for the province. And I was working graveyards. There was these two guys. We had bought out another security company. A couple guys, retired cops, had been moonlighting doing security for like 15 years. And there was a running joke that everyone just told me about, and they would still do, where they would go, hey, 10-7 uh, canoe. And we all thought, you know, oh, whatever, they're messing about. And then we got the new uh, Sonim company phones that are all GPS tracked. All the telematics are tracked. And one night these guys call me, oh, you know, 10-7 canoe. I figure they're over at uh, the coffee shop, packing a dart, doing whatever. <laughs> and uh, I decided after an hour of them being 10-7 canoe to look up their phones. Well, we see that their phones are out in the middle of a lake. So we roll over there, it's in the city, roll over, shine our lights out into the middle of the lake, and there's two dudes out in a canoe. Call their phone, see one of them answer, and tell them, hey, row your canoe back over here, boys, like you're in the middle of a shift. Turns out they're out there splitting a six-pack of beer in the middle of a shift, out in a canoe. And all those years of 10-7 canoe, they were really going off duty and going out in the canoe. Who figured? Anyway, have a good night, boys. Okay, a couple observations here. First of all, he is Canadian, and um, I they, love the aboots. He put plenty of aboots in there. <laughs> they were only sharing a six pack, um, which is a Canadian lunch break, I believe. Uh, so they were uh, apparently lightweights. So, um, but man, what a great story! Uh, just you know, fl floating a boot in a boat. Maybe that's how it goes. I didn't, uh, it's, it's so weird to hear how, how Canadians live and it's, it's both at once, um, a reminder that they're there and it, it also just that everything you think about them is true. I grew up on the Canadian border. For those of you that don't know, I grew up in Western New York and, uh, I, I was a bike ride slash, uh, long walk away from, uh, Canada. We'd go there all the time. And, um, it is, it is, as everybody describes it, like, uh, beer is popular. 
hockey is very popular and um, they have the greatest sense of humor. Like, uh, the, you know, the kids in the hall. I don't know if John, you're a fan. You're kind of kids weird. in the hall. And what was the other one? Strangers with candy. I don't know if you ever saw that. Strangers with candy was more of a, an Americanized uh, because that was um, Amy Sedaris. The, that was David Sedaris's brother. That was Stephen Colbert. Actually, that was an offshoot of, it was a comedy central show. So it was an offshoot of all that. But uh, uh, it, did you ever see Corner Gas? That was another Canadian show. And no. then uh, I think even Shits Creek is Canadian, isn't it? Well, it, Catherine O'Hara and Eugene Levy are both uh, from SCTV, which was one of the original Toronto comedy troops that uh, that did late night comedy. They were kind of like the Canadian version of Saturday Night Live, except they were good and funny. That was one of the benefits of growing up on the Canadian border, by the way. You got to see. Uh, all of the primetime sitcoms a day before. So, yeah, uh, yeah, you filthy Canada toucher, get over it. All right, let's move on. <laughs> so, um, as we, as they say up where that guy is an officer, no canoes is good canoes. Here's the next call. Hello, I'm a non sworn officer in the Southern California area. I have a funny story of my father in law, who was a sheriff's deputy in the Southern California area. Uh, he was working on a small island in the Southern California area. And uh, he gets a 911 call from this frantic person. And he was reporting some, you know, annoying type of call, you know, nothing is nothing in emergency. So that the father and I kept telling him, hey, you need to call the non emergency number. You need to call the non emergency number. This is not an emergency. So he hangs up. He calls the non emergency number. But when he calls the non emergency number, it's my father-in-law, so he's answering both of the phone numbers, both of the phones at this small island. He's a, the dispatcher and everything, and whenever he gets called, he goes to the call himself. So he answered the phone on the, on the non-emergency line, and this person was uh, very mad, saying, you know, I just talked to you on the phone, um, and I'm calling you back again. Just a little funny story. Please do your best to, to brighten our day. Oh, no, we don't want to start that yet. Please do your best to brighten our day, our day by leaving us a voicemail at 848-COM-911. That's 848-266-6911. Uh, and you can most certainly call us and talk to us live. And I think you're about to, uh, we're about to talk to some people live by the end of the show. But I did, I, I did tell uh, Chief Keefe, as you call him from one more, and I'm out of here to uh, wait till the end of the show, because I guess... He feels like uh, since he hosts a podcast too, he's kind of a VIP guy. He feels like he should go to the head of the line, and um, so he'll call in at some point. I told him to kind of wait till the end of the show. We can have a, we can have a just a, a a key for hour, I guess, and he can tell us what's going on on some other podcast. Yeah, right. Um, all right. So what's next? I mean, should we get into what we we're here to do? Yeah, I think we should. And I think we got to, you know, we got initially before we go, we got to pump the brakes. Yeah, it's kind of funny. All the all the jokes that we had about it and uh, some conspiracy theories. Even I was pretty full of like, you know, because it was pre-election and you were just wondering what the heck's going on with this. You know, who really sent this guy? What's this really about? But, you know, after you see the body cam footage and you see this guy get attacked with a hammer, um, you could see that it's kind of a by the numbers, you know political assault which is really not what you want in this country regardless of how you feel you know i'm sure people of this fans of this podcast probably not a lot of pelosi fans i can't really say i'm a big fan of hers i don't really want to see her her husband getting uh, attacked with a hammer but this uh is an interesting case as an m1 dispatcher because i remember listening to the initial audio on it and just thinking right away i'm like well this guy you know he can't he can't speak in the clear he's got somebody in the house with him and he's and what i've have learned since then reviewing the cases the guy's also terrified right yeah absolutely i mean we're, we're going to hear the 911 call in a second and get your full analysis of it and uh share some stories because i think we both have had uh similar incidents i i i, I gotta be honest uh i i partook initially i mean you know look it, it becomes internet lore very quickly but you know it's it's kind of um uh, sometimes easy to get lost in the shuffle that a 70 something year old man got bopped in the head by a hammer and he was in critical condition for a couple of days. So, I mean, 
it was easy to to just you know once if you don't have video and you don't have the 911 call then we're left to kind of fill in the blanks so everyone's just going to kind of speculate and everybody's an expert as we know on online so um i think that's kind of what happened here i even you know i went down that road and i i put out a reel i can't remember what i said that we should call it but um it, it had to do with the i remember using the sledgehammer the the uh peter gabriel song as the as a soundtrack for my reel but uh at any rate uh once i saw all of everything in totality i kind of um uh, i kind of changed my tune about this thing a little bit it's it's a crap yeah. word and, and it's just you, you have to take out the um the you know whether you are a former or whether you are a fan of the former speaker of the house nancy pelosi or not take all that out. I mean, this, this guy has somebody break into his house and bop him in the head with the hammer in front of two cops. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, a- it's, it's straight aggravated assault. And not only that, but you know, if we are going to address any of the politics, let's put them aside to say, so suppose, you know, and I don't know if our listeners are aware, but he did call a, a Fox affiliate and kind of give his manifesto about what he thinks. And um, some of it maybe is more sensical than others, but if you do believe that this is a country of ideals or it's a republic or it's or or it's a it's a country by the people for the people, well, I don't think anyone ever intended us for it to go start beating our statesmen or our politicians or their spouses. So I think we could just pump the brakes on all the politics and get get to the fact that somebody was assaulted. Let's uh let's listen to the nine one one call, shall we? Friday, October. San Francisco, please, 74. 2022. Oh, I guess I, I, guess I, I, I called on the What is it? This is San Francisco, please. Do you need help? John, if you need me to stop, just wave your hand. Oh, well, there's a gentleman uh, here just waiting for my wife to come back. Nancy Pelosi. Uh, he's just uh, waiting for her to come back. She's not going to be here for a day, so I guess we'll have to wait. Okay, do you need police fire or medical for anything? Uh, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Zero, two, twenty, three, and fifty-eight seconds. Uh, there's, there's the, uh, um, is the Capitol Police around? No, this they, is that They usually protect my wife. They're usually, here, they're usually here at the house protecting my wife. Uh, no, this is San Francisco in. Police. Friday, October. I, I, no, I understand. Um, okay, well, uh, and what do you think? Uh, he thinks everything's good. Uh, I, I've got a problem, but he thinks everything's good. Uh, okay, call us back if you need your mind. No, 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 this, this gentleman just uh, came into the house uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. And so, uh, anyway, he's on the phone. Do you know who the person is? No, I don't know who he is. He, he, uh, uh, he has this, he's telling me, he's he's telling me not to, uh, he's telling me not to do anything. What is your address, sir? Uh, 2640 Broadway. What is your name? Uh, My name is Paul Pelosi. Friday, anyway, this, this gentleman says that uh, he thinks everything ought to, you know, he, he told me to put the phone down and uh, just do what he said. Okay? Okay, who, what's the gentleman's name? I don't know. What's that? My name's David. The, the name is David. Okay, and who is David? I, I don't know. I, what's that? I'm a friend of theirs. Yeah, I, I, um, he says he's a friend, but... But you don't know who he is? No, no, ma'am. Okay. He's telling me I'm being very lazy, so i, I got to stop Zero, talking to you, okay? Okay. You sure I can seconds. stay on the phone with you just to make sure everything's okay? No, he, he wants me to get the hell off the phone. Zero, two, okay. Okay. And Thank you. Seconds. Okay, bye. Oh, First... Okay. First thing I want to say is I want to apologize for the Doctor Who robot in the background who constantly reminds you what time it is. We didn't just put that in there to be funny or to annoy you. 
for whatever reason, you know, San Francisco <laughs> PD's communication center, instead of just time stamping at once, they constantly remind you of when that happened. I'm no, sorry, no, that's very no. annoying. And I'm not even sure why the voice is British. Maybe it was discounted. I'm not sure. We had the same software where I worked. It, it just, <clears throat> sometimes you just leave that in there, especially for court purposes. So you can show that it hasn't been altered. The time hasn't been altered and it's a continuous. Uh, it, I mean, you can, you can time it in real time in essence. Th there is a feature, by the way, to mute that. But it, so if it's going to go to the media, it'll be a clean version. But uh, obviously they didn't use that. Would have been would have been nice if they had, but I appreciate you playing the whole thing because it's such a bizarre call. But I, if if you would, I would like to go back through it at, at kind of in stages to kind of give you my take on it. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll I, I'll tell the story of. I, I would call. love that. I was thinking of uh, you just uh, having you break it down. Uh, I'll chime in a little bit. Maybe we'll play it again when people see it in a new light with your information there, and then okay. uh, we'll take it. Go for it. Okay, so maybe you have seen a, that commercial before where um, a woman is calling uh, 911. The operator answers and uh, she goes, yeah, I'm calling to order a pizza. And a very humdrum. And he goes, uh, I'm sorry, what was that? I'm like, yeah, a large pizza. And it goes on in that fashion where she goes, pepperoni, mushroom, on, you know, just regular pan crust or whatever. And finally, the dispatcher realizes, like, you realize you're calling 911, right? And she goes, yep, yep, that would be that. That's correct. And so now she's answering yes or no questions. Are you in danger? Yes. And he's the operator able to answer, answer those, ask and answer those yes or no questions. Uh, it's not at all uncommon that you would have a someone who was calling who couldn't speak in the clear. Uh, sometimes when you get that, it's not as cut and dry as someone calling for pizza. Obviously, this guy, you know, he's an older guy. Um, He's having a hard time basically calling 911 and being able to say, like, look, there's a guy in my house who's threatening my life. Um, we'll break it down line by line. But what the first thing that kind of caught me was that he was asking for Capitol Police, uh, which I think was supposed to tip her hand that, you know, that something pretty significant was going on. But in my experience, it went down actually kind of similar to the commercial where there was a house in the countryside. It was not inside the city limits. It was just way out. And uh, somebody called me and uh, was pretending that I was their uncle. So it's like, oh, yeah, how are you? How are the kids and all this? And she kind of kept going like, ma'am, you realize you're you're calling 911, right? Yes, yes, that's exactly right. And finally, I was like, is there someone there with you? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Are you in danger right now? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, you you kind of, uh, your, your blood almost curdles there a little bit because you've got an in-progress situation that until right at this moment, you didn't fully understand. So. You hit mute, you get on the radio, you start units going that way to that house and you say, you know, the reporting party is not able to speak in the clear and I'm going to attempt to gather more information while you're en route. That's when you go straight to yes or no questions and she has to do the best she can. Um, in this case, she was a better actor than uh, Mr. Pelosi, but establishing the number of people in the house, uh, establishing their location in the house, weapons, uh, things like that, those are all helpful. Um, I'm not here to criticize this 911 dispatcher because this this call is absolutely bizarre and it's nothing like in, in my experience. But uh, that's what you would you would do is you essentially try to establish yes and no questions that they can answer uh, that you need to know uh, and get that information out to your units. In some ways, it's easier than having somebody screaming at you on a typical 911 call because you can control that information with yes and no pretty quickly. Drew, you ever have anything like that when you were a dispatcher? Uh, plenty. I mean, <clears throat> there's somebody in the chat tonight who I want to acknowledge, somebody who I used to look up to, Michelle Thomas. She she worked with me for, uh, I worked with her actually for a very long time. She was there for uh, quite a while. Her mom worked at our office too. Uh, great, 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 great person. Uh, I miss her sometimes. Uh, but she's uh, in the chats with us tonight. She's had plenty of uh, stories or she has plenty of stories just like this. So I definitely want to get Michelle on here at some point. Um, and she's saying all the same things uh, like, man, I can't believe that they hung up. And um, it's just, it's all in how you're trained. You're trained just to stay on the phone with them. Now, the other thing is too, like you can't force anybody to do anything that they don't want to do one. And two, you kind of have to draw a little fine line or, or jump to a few conclusions here because he's in duress. He's, this is the, this is pretty much um, when it finally clicked for this dispatcher, this is pretty much somebody saying, Hey, blink twice if you need help. Yeah. Um, she didn't really come out and say it 
like the pizza commercial did. I mean, uh, and by the way, there's, there's a couple examples of actual pizza calls. I tried to find one, but, uh, there's one in Ohio, um, Oregon, Ohio, that's uh, pretty prominent, but, um, so she, she tried to get, uh, she, once it, once it clicked, I mean, this did trigger a, uh, welfare, a check the welfare. And if you'll remember, the day after this, uh, not not the day after this was released, but the day after the incident occurred, uh, the police chief in San Francisco totally gave credit to the 911 dispatcher and said, "And she should because she yeah. got a unit there, yes. and that's what's most important." She she said, "Well, you know, if you change your mind, call me back." You know, that's right. That's right at the critical moment where she's like, "This is just." This is just somebody who's maybe disoriented or something, doesn't know who they called. And then he says, no, 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 no. And then, and that's really the moment where, where she kicked in and started engaging, and the, and which was great. So I see a couple people making reference to um, like him saying, him talking about Capitol Police. I, I think that was more of um, kind of his way of, of I, I don't want to say like, throwing influence around but maybe no. to get their attention like no you know, because uh, my wife nancy <laughs> yeah he, he's trying to draw attention to the fact that this is you know a, a possible attempted political assassination i mean the context here is that sh this guy's here to find nancy pelosi right and by asking for the capitol police you know that's how you alert the 911 dispatcher like hey this is a significant event that's going on because she's probably not a dispatcher for the Capitol Police. She dispatches San Francisco PD. So when he starts mentioning the Capitol Police, the mere fact that that even comes up is going to start changing the dispatcher's thinking. From time to time, you'll get celebrities calling 911 or you get somebody that knows a celebrity. If you were, if you work in an agency, that's, you know, the size of the one where I worked or uh, in San Francisco and San Francisco is rife with, you know, with celebrities. So sometimes it's just not like it's and and you can't go by income because uh, everybody's pretty wealthy in, in yeah. that part of town. So um, it's just, uh, you know, I think she did the best. I think it was kind of a critical mistake to say, well, just call us back if, if something else, you know, but near mistake. Yeah. Near mistake, but it's two two fifteen, two thirty in the morning. She might have the sleepies and maybe not thinking. Maybe she's not thinking straight. But it could be. But just just to be on her defense and to play devil's advocate, this is a, a bizarre call to start with. Where it's, I think, the morning, like you said, it kind of plays into that. Where it's somebody who's incoherent, he's disoriented. Drew, how many calls have you taken from a nursing home where someone doesn't even know that they're in a nursing home? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, that's kind of where I would start with. Like this, this is a call about nothing. He thinks he's calling somebody else. It. He's not completely with it. Um, so I don't I don't fault her for that at all. One person in the chats mentioned is text to 911 a thing. And text to 911 is a thing in most jurisdictions or it's coming soon. And we are using it for that exact purpose. Uh, we had a call or a text the other day where someone said, I've got a fugitive in the car with me. And we were able to direct him to go drive to the police and figure out how many people were in the car and if he had weapons and a whole bunch of stuff and he never had to talk out loud while the passenger was there. So that's another great example of not being able to talk in the clear, uh, but texting to 911 also has its own, own limitations. One thing being that it's incredibly slow. Yeah. Um, it's uh, that, that's going to take some getting used to. We, we just rolled out in, in the agency here in the big, the big place where I used to work uh, texting 911 within the last year. I mean, it's not, or maybe it was a year and a half now, but um, it's it, it's an equipment issue, by the way. It's it's not necessarily, you know, I, a lot of it's funded by the phone companies and all that. So it's not the purchase of the equipment. It's the installation of the equipment, though. Like it's it, it's if you're getting all this extra cell phone traffic or text traffic, you got to be your agency infrastructure has to be prepared for it. But yeah, um, like uh, for our system, it's not married to anything else. So I have to transcribe everything that comes in off of the text into the CAD to record it. And at the same time, there's also other bizarre capabilities. Like when I take a text to 911 phone call, it starts recording my voice as if I was on a 911 which can be very uh, unfortunate if I don't realize that I'm being recorded. So for you 911 dispatchers out there taking text to 911 calls, first thing I would recommend that you do is check that. And then if it is recording your voice, make sure to hit mute because if this turns into anything, your case will be subpoenaed as will anything that you say. And anything that you say again will be used against you in a court of law. So just be careful on that.
this uh, this will take you down. A, this will take us down a road. But next gen nine one one is what this is called, like text to to nine one one, and eventually photos and movies to nine one one. But but think about that. I mean, if we're understaffed as it is um, for nine one one calls, we've just made it probably twenty times easier to text to nine one one now. So is the Manning going to keep up? And then there's a whole element of trauma involved in seeing, listen, hearing the hearing, I've discussed this ad nauseum, but hearing stuff, hearing um, like stabbings or shootings as they're happening is very traumatic. No different than witnessing them, you know, with your eyes, you're just witnessing them with your ears. But um, the new element of hearing and seeing it in real time uh, it's going to be a whole different story. So, and, know, and Greg at the chats makes a good point. He says nudes to 911. I could tell you as a 911 operator, first of all, I'm not an EMT or a firefighter. I'm really not into the gore. I'm not into the blood. I'm not into seeing uh, people who have passed away or are grossly injured. But I also don't want to see naked pictures of people. I don't want to see naked pictures of children. I, my worst fear is that someone's going to be like trying to report that, you know, the they have they have a tip about some child pornography and what they do is they want to be anonymous so they just start sending it to me and that i would have to see those things and to be honest with you i really don't want that to ever happen that hasn't come true yet but uh if that is some technology that's coming into the future i could tell you that's something that will there's there's good things about it but there's potentially bad things for operators i I would say another bad thing is someone just taking a picture of a car accident and hoping that's good enough where i don't know where they're at or what's going on so with technology there's always steps forward and steps back right definitely but but you know you can also get the uh you can probably get a better location from their text than maybe just by them telling you where they are there there are nuances associated with it there's actually you know rapid sos and other programs out there that kind of give location and stuff so you say you say that but i currently don't have alley with text to 911 so wow yeah okay Um, so just some points to think about. I mean, so yeah, he is being vague, but he's, he's trying to like Pelosi, you know, my wife, Nancy, uh, you know, third in line to be the president, you know, basically he's not saying that, but that's basically what she is and, uh, or she was anyway. And then, um, um, the guy sounds very clear too, or very calm too. Um, but not as Andrea pointed out, maybe not seated in reality. And, and he's, he gave his full name. Like he doesn't, he didn't, he's not looking for, he's not worried about you finding out who he is. He's there to essentially kill or hurt or maim or injure the speaker of the house because he feels all of these, you know, conspiracies. He's finally connected all the dots. By the way, he wasn't a far right guy. He wasn't a Republican or he wasn't any of that uh, from, all indications. And on top of that, he was a Canadian citizen uh, who was supposed to be deported before all of this. He was not, he was out of status for his immigration from what I know. It all comes back around. They're such nice people. And now, now they're yeah. attempting to alter our politics and kill our people. That could have been David DePap uh, that left us that voicemail for all we know. Not the yeah, one from Central California. All right. So let's do, we'll play one more time. Just kind of listen to it with that. Um, yeah. Pause and we'll comment. I have something to say almost every step of the way so just go for it all right friday october san francisco please 74 2022 oh i guess i i guess i i call them what is it this is san francisco police do you need help oh what is the gentleman uh here just waiting for my wife to come back Nancy Pelosi. Uh, he's just uh, waiting for her to come back. She's not going to be here for a day, so I guess we'll have to wait. Okay, do you need police fire or medical for anything? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Zero, two, twenty, three, and fifty-eight seconds. Uh, there, there's the, uh, um, is the Capitol Police around? No, this they, is they San Francisco. They usually my wife. They're usually here. They're usually here at the house protecting my wife. Uh, no, this is San Francisco in. Police. Friday. She's clearly not getting it, but but he's trying to force it in. In other words, he's trying to say. Well, 
I, I guess I will be a little bit more critical this time around, but you know, it's easy to miss things, but he says, yeah, my wife, Nancy Pelosi, almost right away. Yeah. Um, I could tell you, we have a congressional delegate in my jurisdiction and we're aware of their address. So when you go into your CAD, your computer aided dispatch for all kinds of addresses, you'll have what's called a premise note or premise information. If it's uh, a bank, maybe it's a code to disarm the alarm. If it's a gated community, it's a code to get into that code to get in the airport. Um, it's a keyholder information. Well, for a congressional delegate, particularly a VIP, when you type in that address, you'll actually get a notification that says, hey, just so you know, this is the house of the home of the Speaker of the House. And maybe if you're taking any kind of call from here, it's mandatory dispatch a unit ASAP. Um, I think you're you're dead on there. Uh, I, I think I, and I think that would be a function of the Capitol Police. I mean, it may have been in place at one time for all I know or for all we know. But uh, I think Capitol Police probably should have said, hey, look, if anything comes up at this address, make sure you flag it uh, because this is the speaker's house. And if we're not there, we definitely need someone getting over there to figure out what's it, going on. It's just very confusing because it happens at lower levels. For example, like if we take a call from a judge's house, like we we know to get the U.S. Marshals involved. Like we have training for this. We understand that it happens. We know that important people are in our world. Um, so it, it's just confusing to me that you can hear like my wife, Nancy Pelosi. And maybe it's just because she's almost too big of a figure, maybe. And because it's the middle of the night and he's strangely calm that um, maybe she was thrown off by that. I will well, say I mean, she did offer police, fire and ambulance. And he said no. What he could have said yes. If he had just said yes to that, it might have moved things along a little quicker. Yeah, like, sure. Yeah, just say sure. All right, here. I, I, no, I understand. Um, okay, well, uh, and what do you think? Uh, he thinks everything's good. Uh, I, I've got a problem, but he thinks everything's good. Uh, okay. Call us back if you need your mind. No, 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 this, this gentleman just, uh, came into the house, uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. Zero, and two, so, uh, four, and 40, anyway, he's do, you know, the phone do you know who the person is? No, I don't know who he is. He, he, uh, uh, he has Zero, this, he's telling me, he's, he's telling me not to, uh, he's telling me not to do anything. What is your address, sir? Uh, 2640 Broadway. Zero, two, 25, and zero, what is your name? Uh, my name is Paul Pelosi. Friday, anyway, this, this gentleman says that uh, he thinks everything ought to, you know, he, he told me to put the phone down and uh, just do what he said. Okay? Okay, who, what's the gentleman's name? I don't know. What's that? My name's David. The, the name is David. Okay, and who is David? I, I don't know. I, what's that? I'm a friend of theirs. Yeah, I, I, uh, he says he's a friend, but... But you, don't, but you don't know who he is? No, no, ma'am. Okay. He's telling me I'm being very lazy, so i, I got to stop Zero, talking to you, okay? Okay. You sure I can stay on the phone with you just to make sure everything's okay? No, he, he wants me to get the hell off the phone. Zero, two, okay. Okay. And zero, eight Thank you. Seconds. Okay, bye. I, I don't... I'm... I'm saying the calls like this are not uncommon. They're, they're truly not uncommon. And like, I see a lot of chatter about, you know, he wasn't calm. He was drunk. Okay. I mean, what if he was, it doesn't mean there's not a burglar in his house, right? Do drunk people not get broken into? I mean, what if, what if he does need Ambien to help him sleep and he got woke up? Of course he's going to be out of it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to go to bad for the guy, but I'm just like, these are either. all possibly, it's, possibly legitimate factors. Yeah. Just, just, you know, respectfully speaking, if, if this were my uncle <laughs> or this were my dad, I mean, he's no longer with us, but I mean, if this were my dad uh, and it were two seventeen in the morning and he heard glass breaking and he got well, up. Well, and, it's just surreal too. You know, it's like that this is actually happening. You know? I, I don't, yeah. I don't know that he would put his, um, his Hugo boss suit pants on and you know what I'm saying? Uh, it, you know, he, he, yes, he answered the door with the drink in his hand. Have I ever responded to a residence at two 30 in the morning where somebody's answered the door with the drink in their hand? Yeah. Uh, more than once. I mean, and it's, we don't know if it's water. We don't know if it's vodka, like who cares? Really? It had been poured earlier and he grabbed it. Maybe he thought it was, 
a weapon you know if i had a if i had a hefty rocks glass and this guy's got a hammer maybe i would put something in my hand too that's that's true so when you look at it from uh those perspectives hopefully we're just trying to broaden your your perspective a little bit it, it, not everything is a conspiracy and not everything yep. is a gay male prostitute and let's just play devil's advocate to everything let's just say maybe there's an alternate explanation for it and debate it yeah i mean again uh, i still say uh I, I let me make a motion to the floor who cares like uh, really still, i mean still burglary <laughs> still a guy that smashed literally is on video behind the house taking a hammer out of a backpack smashing several times a window creeping in the window you know after looking inside and then a couple minutes later a 911 call comes in and then you know as we're about to see uh i i see michelle has called it uh, so i want to get to her but i mean it, it, you you'll see how it turns out with the cops. I think the whole thing is just so bizarre. This is one of those slow motion calls. Like it's a slow motion phone call. You're like, God, this is just so weird. What is going on here? Um, and it's like, it's like the first call between you and me, John. And then, yeah. it's, then when you see the body worn camera, it's the exact same thing. The officers are like, what is going like? They're just trying to put some dots together. Nobody's really talking. You got an old man in his, you know, in his skivvies with a drink in his hand. And then you got a dude, you know, a fat dude with a hammer standing, uh, you know, interlocked in his, in his arm. I mean, I, I don't know. Let the, I think we should probably get to the, uh, to the body cam. Do you think? Yeah. I, I will say though, it's just strange things happen in the middle of the night. I woke up once at four in the morning and there was like a two year old boy sitting outside my front door crying. And I called police and I'm sure it seems strange to them. And I'm just like trying to tell them it was strange. All I could tell you is weird shit happens in the middle of the night. And you've raised him as your own ever since. He is my, yes, he is my he is I have adopted with son. He's out in the fields right now doing his work. His name is Franklin and he is 38. Okay, so here's the body one you can. Yeah, definitely don't want all of you. This is what I dig about this. You know, it's he's a young kid. Like, I saw him uh, testify. You know, he's kind of funny. By the way, th this guy, DePap, was uh, indicted in federal court. These are federal charges. So there's not going to be any cameras in the courtroom. And there's some pretty cool drawings of him. Uh, I don't know if Jonathan did them or not. Definitely don't want all of you. Hello. The question is, were they painting those windows or is there actually a blue frame around them? Yeah. Like I said, 2620, right? No, 2640. Oh, cool. Yeah, they're literally sitting there. Hi. How you doing? All right. This is a rather bizarre scene to, to see. I, I, I mean, and... Listen, I'm not making light of this, but in San Francisco, this is probably not out of the ordinary. I mean, yeah, two, they're not they're not thrown by this. Yeah, two dudes open the door. It's like, I, I mean, it's 2023. You, you, nobody should be really taken aback by this, but I mean, like, San Francisco was kind of like the the uh, epicenter of gay culture. So, you got two guys in a very ritzy, wealthy um, condominium or, or townhome or whatever it is. It, it's not going to be that out of the ordinary, but. Um, you know, it just it gets obviously a little crazy as it goes on. What's going on, man? Everything's good. Hi. That light, that flashlight is so key. If you're an officer out there, keep that light on you. Keep that light charged. Use your cell phone light if you don't have your little LED with you. But, man, that, that right there, illuminating their hands, that's what saved this whole thing. So strange, too, just what's going on here. Like, Paul's got his hands on it, and David seems to have his hand on his wrist and the, and the handle of the hammer. They, but they don't appear like they're struggling. They're almost like, hey, guys, come on in. And, and again, this is just this just adds another layer of bizarreness to all of this where, you know, yeah. clearly something is wrong. But what? You know, like, until we see what comes next, we still have really no idea what the heck's going on. Right. And we have the benefit of um, hindsight. hindsight. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but illuminating their hands, they're in a darkened hallway, illuminating their hands or illuminating just like them. 
um, it just it puts a different no pun intended it puts a different light on the entire situation now they start reacting a little bit drop the hammer i mean so he, he you know we should go back and maybe look at the time i don't know that we have the time to do it but we're talking about 12 or 15 seconds after contact he's already telling him drop the hammer no. hey, 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 hey. so paul has his hand on the hammer I think that's because he knows it's going to it's gonna hit him. He's almost yep. like, it's like he's getting inside the swing of a baseball bat at that point. I think he knows if he releases it, it's coming for him immediately. Right. What is going on right now? I'm not getting an answer on call, but... oh, 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 shit. Oh. I, I just have to ask, could you imagine? I, I mean, f first of all, you're, you're thinking uh, perhaps like, is this fucking Paul Pelosi? <laughs> Or, or I'm not them. even there yet. All I am seeing is, is, is I'm there for two seconds, and all of a sudden a guy is getting brained with a hammer. You know? <laughs> right. It's like, like, it's like your, own, your own mind has to catch up with what you just saw. I mean, you I, hear them. They're like, oh, shit. And I get you know? like the, the, there are plenty of cops that are, be, that are like, man, they should got rid of the hammer. They got rid of that. But they did. They told them, hey, drop the hammer. And it's a lethal then weapon, said, too, what? by the way. I mean. What's that? It's a lethal weapon, too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. But. Are they too close to take a deadly four shot? Oh, I mean, I'm not. I'm not advising that necessarily. I just want to. It I mean, is. It's the, lethal. the lethality of the situation. You know, you getting hit in the head with a hammer one time, and you can be done with that. So it's a lethal weapon, as is a movie with uh, Danny Glover and Bill Gibson. Edward 14, Edward 10, backup, code 3. Code 3, backup, code 6. Give me your fucking hand! Give me your fucking hand! Edward 14, Edward 10, medics, code 3 as well. You got it? Okay, do you hear, and I, I'm, it's going to sound like I'm making light of it, but I'm not, and this is probably where Kiefer would come in. Uh, do you hear the walrus? I mean, you, you obviously hear like some deep snoring or some odd sounds, and, and that's, you know, I, I see that online a lot, like, oh, yeah, he just, he knocked him out so bad that he fell right asleep, or no, my uh... friends. That, no, that is, that's that's a red flag called, to every nine one one dispatcher. Yeah, that that's what's called death rattle. That that's called th that death rattle occurs um, usually within the within twenty four hours of death, and it's when like mucus and fluids get caught in your throat, and that's that was a deep death rattle. I mean, if you're if if you hear that um, agonal breathing, yeah, agonal I'm breathing. If that. you hear, if you hear that, you better call Chief Keefe uh, pretty quick. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, that's it. So um, we did have one person in the chats. Uh, I just feel like it was an interesting comment. Katie Case said she dumps the authenticity of it. That this was not a cop knock. That it, this was. I saw that. Let, let's listen kind of to the cop knock. And they, and they were casual walking up to it right? because they don't. Yeah, definitely like, don't want all of you. They, they get a 911 call. I don't know if they put the name in there, but they get a 911 call like, just go check on this guy because it just doesn't sound right. And I think it's probably a, just a general welfare check at this point. Right. I definitely don't want all of you. Hello. Okay. I, I'll agree. I'll give you that, Katie. Uh, that's not a cop knock. That's not a uh, slam your uh, your light on the door. But let's let's look at time, place, and manner here. Uh, <laughs> you're in multi-millionaire row. You're in California, where uh, the cops can never do anything right anyway. Um, so I, I'm just going with he saw a light on in there and just kind of tapped on the door to make sure something's not going on. I I I, I do get that that's not like the typical like get somebody's attention kind of cop knock. I'll give you that. John, you agree? I've never had to knock on anyone's doors, anyone's door like that, so I think that's kind of your purview, Drew. Okay. Well, then he used the door knocker. So, 
I think I, I think the whole banging in the door, sheriff's department. I think that's a very TV or movie thing. I don't. Yeah, what knockers? That's that's great, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, and that blue tape. So you did see it. Um, <clears throat> Pain, painter's tape. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so w- what what are some of the other comments we have here about this? Uh, like, does it change your mind? Any? Does it? Like, I'm not in this to change your mind, but I I can tell you that there is actual video of this guy breaking into the back of the house, and I, I'm all about building probable cause right in life even uh because i can't let that go so um if you build the probable cause in this case you have a wackadoo or a wacky 911 call with a bunch of red laden with a bunch of red flags you have physical physical video that doesn't even make sense you have actual video secure uh security footage of a guy peeking in the back window at two in the morning, going into a backpack full of stuff of, of God knows what, taking out an actual hammer, smashing the window a few times, and then crawling in. And then you have this f- like freaky deaky incident where you're like, hey, do me a favor and drop the hammer. And he's like, no, I, I think I'm just going to bash a skull in instead. Um, when you take those things in totality, I think it lends to this is just an authentic break-in. Like, it, it, I'm sure plenty of people would love for this to be a conspiracy or love for this to to shed bad light on the Pelosi's or whatever. I mean, um, but that's why I say in the description of this, take take the jokes out of it and take the um, take the uh, put some humanity in it. Take take the um, uh, can, not the conspiracies, but the 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 hatred towards you know. The, take the politics out of it is what I'm trying to say. Um, I, I think you have a legitimate, uh, if you, if that were anybody else, it would be an interesting case. April in the comments makes a good comment too. She says they were matching energies. Okay. So you don't know what's going on in the house and you go up there and you start beating the door. If there's a tense situation, all of a sudden uh, a loud noise or something like that's just going to make it worse. You know, whoever the suspect is, all of a sudden they think it's the door's about to get kicked in. You know, their defense is going to go way up. If they just hear a gentle knock, the situation is still under control. And maybe it's about just not escalating things with that knock. I, I I tend to agree with Bone Cold Fleas Austin 316 as well. He's like, look, she's third in the line of succession. I had to correct John on this earlier. She's third in line uh, in line for succession, <clears throat> meaning if the president and the vice president for some reason go down. I thought the president pro tem of the Senate was after her, after those two. But is isn't she, by virtue of being the Speaker of the House, the no, no. you're right. So maybe she's the fourth. She's fourth, yeah. President, Vice President, President Pro Tem, Speaker of the House. Okay, thank you, Lincoln. So, <clears throat> so she's number four, and, and he's got a good point. Like, uber powerful. Where is security? But the the thing is, <clears throat> the the Capitol Police, who by the way, are a phenomenal outfit. I, I'm I, I had direct dealings with them during the 2012. Um, Republican National Convention, which was here in Tampa. They have a dignitary protection side. They have a uh, uniform side. Those guys are awesome. They are top-notch dudes. Now, there are a couple exceptions, as we saw in the hearings, but uh, those guys are are top-notch. Um, so I, I don't think that they're afforded residential protection 24-7. I think that they're more centric on the on the the protectee. So if she's not in the house, the protection's not in the house. The family is not afforded the same protections as, say, a, a president or a vice president. Like the, the the entire president's entire family is protected by Secret Service. The vice president's entire family is protected by Secret Service. But uh, these are just there. This is not how Capitol Police operates. I think that they just protect who they're supposed to protect, not their entire family, unless there's a credible threat. President pro tems four. Sorry, everyone. So, Speaker of the House is three. Yeah, you're right. As always, Drew, I apologize. I'm sorry. That was an Apollo what? I should not talk and I shouldn't be on the show. You've said it a million times. I apologize. Okay. I'll tell you what, John. Hold on a second. There. Okay. We're going to go to Michelle now. Uh, for those of you listening, I've put uh, John in somewhat of a timeout. Here is uh, an old friend of mine, Operator 69, as it were. 
Hi, buddy. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. How are you? Long time no see. I'm good. I'm good, right? Happy been? Oh, great. What are you up to these days? Are About you five, six? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, you've shrunk two inches. So I uh, um, I know, right? <laughs> Uh, you, you definitely got out of the dispatch business and I definitely don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, you, oh no, put me on the spot. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so you left where we worked, um, probably for a, a few reasons, but, uh, I'll leave that up to you to share. <laughs> we worked in the same spot, had probably very similar, uh, encounters, but all in all, it was a great experience, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, and we also had a good. I have nothing bad, nothing bad to say. It was a good, it was a good time. <laughs> we, we had a great crew around us too. We, I mean, we really did have a good. We time. did. And, we and, absolutely did. And for those listening, I'm not talking about the, my time as a cop. I'm talking about my time as a dispatcher. I started as That's a dispatcher. That's right. We're back in the olden days. Yeah, <laughs> right. When people had rotary phones, literally. So. <laughs> This is great hearing from you. I know that you have some pretty intriguing stories and I definitely want to talk to you about them and uh, we can sort them out and maybe get them on the air if, if you're up for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's if I have COVID right. brain, so it's, my memory's not real good, but I'll yeah. do my best. I got <laughs> it. Well, my friend, I can't thank you enough for calling. I wish you well. And uh, of course. I'm always of a chat. Of course, of course. I'm always a, a DM away. Oh, I appreciate it. And I'm, I mean, I, I got a couple of uh, a synopsis on this guy. Is this cognitive issues mixed with a little bit of vodka and maybe the unfamiliarity of San Francisco who doesn't live in their jurisdiction? Maybe they ought to, they ought to look out for it. Who, who Pelosi or or De Pep? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we always knew where Schwarzkopf's house was when he was in Tampa. God bless him. A thousand percent. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, okay, you, you do bring a great point. Like we, we kind of knew where the celebrities were, or where they, and it wasn't Absolutely. even a just in case. Like it, it was a, uh, you know, listen, back in the day. Uh, telephone, telegraph, <laughs> teledispatcher. Those were the three m methods of communication because we all were interconnected with uh, society somehow because when you have downtime yeah. up in that communication center, you do nothing but research. And that's how we got to be good yeah. investigators anyway. But uh, sure. you bring yeah. a good point. I mean, I, I think uh, probably incorporated into the new training program at San Francisco PD might be uh Hey, if, yeah, I mean, you, you don't want to get caught on the on hard copy with stuff like that. Oh my God, know. that's right, right. But I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure they did. I'm sure, I'm sure they did their best. I'm certainly not to no, 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 anybody on that one. We're definitely that, not here. That to was a tough call. Yeah, we know what's going on with that. We but. have the benefit of hindsight. That's what we always say. Oh well, yeah, hundred percent. Armchair quarterback is easy. <laughs> in the comfort of our homes thank you again for calling exactly. my friend i'll be talking to you soon i'm gonna go to uh You're welcome brother good to speak to you <laughs> good to speak to you i'm gonna go to jason the one and only chief keith who is uh in anderson township uh some type of fire apparatus operator uh or some type of apparatus operator anyway and and uh here he is. I mean, uh, straight off of uh, one more and I'm out of here's uh, groundbreaking interview with Marty Brenneman, the former uh, Cincinnati Reds broadcaster, Hall of Famer. Jason, how are you feeling uh, now that you've arrived in celebrity? You have no idea. I, I, I'm figuring out exactly how it feels to be Drew Brady right now. <laughs> Well, if you want to spend 10 minutes in these shoes, you're more than welcome, my friend. <laughs> thanks for, uh, thanks for taking my call, Philip. Thanks for calling. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about agonal breathing versus death rattle? Well, you've got like storing respirations is like put in the, in the chat and then agonal breathing, which I mean, it, it, like, most of the time are synonymous with, you know, you're not controlling the position of your tongue, so you're you're not having a good open patent airway. So whatever air as he is exhaling is rattling on the tongue, but he's not able to get, you know, good respirations in, which 
that in turn, you know, if you don't deal with that, obviously you're going to have a bad outcome. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, and, and, and I guess that would be the, uh, head tilt chin lift uh <laughs> that would be one of the reasons for that probably and correct and since he took since he took a blow to the head uh it would be more of a uh, uh jaw thrust maneuver because oh. there could be cervical spine issues but at that point all you're doing is trying to get air you know in the end so that way he doesn't go out any further well, thank you for your medical expertise. Are you uh, are you excited as we are, as John and I are, about April, the, about mid-April in Clayton, North Carolina, where we're doing our uh, meetup? Hopefully, everybody is saving, uh, is taking all that money out of their cuss jars and putting it towards airline tickets or gas money to get to Clayton, North Carolina. Are you excited about it? I am absolutely stoked. I think we are getting in Sunday night later. Um, I think my two counterparts are driving down on Tuesday and leaving Thursday. I'm flying out Friday. So it'll be a you know a good four to four and a half days of I'm sure debauchery. Yeah. Good for you guys. <laughs> yeah, it'll be fun. It's gonna be a blast. Yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good to meet you know Jonathan and uh Dead Legs, you know, make it um you know, obviously we had a blast hanging out with you guys, you and uh Eric, when you guys were up here, um, so looking forward to a little mini mini getaway and and uh, having a great time. Break bread, have a few, and raise a few glasses. I, I I don't want you to be intimidated by the fact that Jonathan is only five foot eight, uh, but he is a stocky five foot eight, <laughs> and and his beard is on well, fleek. He'll I, like I, me because I'm shaped like a fire I hydrant. Sit anywhere, but we'll get him one anyway. <laughs> All right, my man. Thank you very much for calling. That was uh, the one and only Chief Keith from Anderson Township in uh, the Cincinnati area. Uh, if you're ever there, please, and you need to talk to uh, him, you can just uh, pull one of those red alarm things at any school and you will be seeing him soon. Um, so, John, do you have any parting words? Yeah, I want to say I'm looking forward to meeting everybody out there in Clayton, too. Um, I also just want to apologize again. I friend of mine from college go way back. She's watching tonight and she sent me a message and she said that I haven't changed in the past 20 years that I'm still getting in trouble for trying to be a smarty pants. And really the only thing that's worse is that it's not just 20 people in a classroom. Now it's whatever our audience size is. When will I learn that I never learn? I think, uh, being a smarty pants is uh, way better than being a dummy pants. Don't be a dummy pants. And if we, if we haven't learned anything tonight, I think it's don't be a dummy pants. I do both in equal amounts. And I think that's why it's the most frustrating because sometimes, all right, I won't, I won't go into it. I want to remind everybody rate and review on iTunes on Spotify. We thank you all for watching drew. I don't know if you have anything else. We don't have any other phone calls tonight. No, we don't have any other phone call. Oh, wait a minute. We have Brian, a longtime uh, fan of the show and former dispatcher who is now a deputy. We just, uh, we're going to go to uh, I think I've talked to Brian before. Get him on here, man. Okay, let's just, let's go to Brian and then we'll call it a night. But I definitely, thank you for calling, Brian. You're on. Hey, Drew Breezy, what is happening? <laughs> What's up, man? I'm, uh, I left you guys a message a, a couple weeks ago, right when the show was getting started. Uh, messaged a little bit with uh, with John, your uh, your better half as well. Yes. And I just wanted to see if maybe you guys are willing to to talk a little bit about the Paul Pelosi incident. Yes, of course. But what? Sure. So, so I mentioned. Oh, sorry. I was going to say I mentioned the dead leg when I called. Um, so real real quick, I, I was a dispatcher for almost five years before I went to the academy. I had a you know late midlife crisis that was uh, in my mid 40s when I did that, and I've uh, been uh, on patrol ever since. Um, from the dispatcher standpoint, I, I think the the dispatcher did a fantastic job. Not you know like yeah, she got what she needed. I think she definitely could tell that there was something not right about the call, um, and 100 percent you know send send officers to check, especially you know. If, you know, if you're if you live under a rock and you don't know who Nancy Pelosi is, and you know whatever, but I can't <laughs> right. imagine that she didn't know that. 
That's how you, that's how they fill uh, juries though, by the way. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Somebody exactly. has to be an ignorant slob around here. <laughs> that's that's true. And sometimes, you know, we uh we all are playing that role. <laughs> um but uh, yeah, I, I think on the uh on the officer side of it too, uh them, you know, they definitely were talking about it coming up and I think that their spidey senses were kind of tingling. Yeah, definitely. Um, but they knew that there was something not right. Um, and I think honestly, they had a, they showed a lot of restraint with their lack of use of deadly force, because I think, you know, any officer in that situation could definitely articulate, uh, yes, I had him at gunpoint for X, you know, reason he was holding the hammer. And then when he started swinging it, I I think that probably I would say eight or nine, 10 out of 10 cops would probably have shot that guy. Imminent um, threat so of think, death or great bodily harm to yourself or to someone else. I mean that that fits the de- the, yep, the very I, definition. Yeah, absolutely. And and I don't think that uh, I think you know the agency that I, that I work for. I don't think that they would question necessarily the um, the use of force if it was articulated in that manner. Um, it's definitely not against our policy, and it's you know fully in line with you know our governing. Uh, penal code as well so um i appreciate you calling in and and mentioning the lethal use of force this kind of redeems me a little bit (laughs) yeah and i mean there's some agencies you know not everybody has uh you know that forethought to go into something like that and automatically think like you know what can we do can we you know should we maybe uh you know go up there with you know maybe a less lethal option already ready or maybe we'll go there with a canine not everybody has that option. Right. Um, and it sounds like these guys were just like, Hey, let's just go check this 911. Sounds kind of weird. Let's just make sure he's okay. I, um, I, I'll bet you, I'll bet you a, a million dollars that you've had the, the same feeling I've had on a call where you debrief it afterwards and you're standing around scratching your heads and you still, and you say, you know, I don't think I would approach that any more different than, than I did the first time. Like it just some sometimes yeah. it's so strange but true that it just unfolds right in front of you and and there are no warning signs. I mean, there's a great warning sign in this one. There's a dude holding somebody's wrist and he's got a hammer in the other hand. I mean, that's a pretty good warning sign. Yeah. But, exactly. And I mean, just looking at a face value without the call, if you're just looking at the video, you see a guy who's fully clothed holding the hammer. I think he had it in two hands. And then you've got Paul Pelosi, who's, you know, got what a, a shirt and a, and his underwear on and that's it. Yeah. Trying to, you know, stop him from doing whatever he's going to do. And so just at face value, you, I think that those guys, like, I, I wouldn't say that in my agency, we wouldn't automatically draw down on that guy. Um, I, I think, most guys probably would. Well, Mike, you know, Micah in the but, chats here has brought up a good point, Brian. Um, and this is where we've come because of, of uh, you know, the quote police reform and quote, like everybody's so worried about how we handle use of force. And, and I get it. I mean, we, we have to be accountable, but Micah says sometimes unsnapping your holster in some departments is considered a use of force. So, you know, it's limiting police yeah. officers or it's making it's making police officers think twice about doing all that stuff, which I think they think is mission accomplished. But I say, yeah, that's what's getting everybody killed. That's what's getting a, a hammer to Paul Pelosi's head. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, just within our agency, I'm not going to say where I work, uh, but, you know, recently within I think it was just a year ago. Um, and, you know, if you go from low ready to actually pointing your firearm at someone, then that is, we have to file a use of force report, oh, which I mean, okay. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you're pointing a lethal weapon at someone, but you know, are you pulling the trigger? Are you, you know, taking someone down forcefully to stop them from, uh, you know, taking it, you know, swinging a hammer at somebody, or are you using whatever arrest and control tactics you've been taught to uh, prevent them from resisting arrest or escaping? No, you, I mean, you're, so the, on the that use of force matrix, you know, people will say, and I mean, Drew, you probably, you know, came up in that same time frame where, yeah, you would go to probably, you know, half of your calls and end up 
breaking leather and have, you know, somebody at gunpoint, but it was warranted. And now that people see that as, you know, you pointing a gun at them as a use of force. Right. Then everything has changed. Well, well, think of this as well. Um, Honey Badger brought up another great point. Like, think of this. Uh, your agency now uh, includes handcuffing as a use of force. They now include, uh, you know, taking your gun out of your holster or unsnapping the mere unsnapping of your holster, taking your asp out of your asp case. It's now. So, what do you think? So now you have to report all of that, right? So when you only had thirty yeah. uses of forces, uh, uses of force in twenty twenty one, and you have. 648 uses of force in 2022 what, what does that say about the agency i mean there, there's no way that your local paper is going to paint the picture that no they just started counting everything that's that that's the reason for the increase yeah. what they're going to report is no they, look at these they went they've gone nuts and, they, and now every, and now they're beating up everybody because they use the word use of force and yeah. make it synonymous with a beating of some sort when nine times out of 10, it's a defensive maneuver. Exactly. And and that's like you said, it's, you know, it's the reported actual reported uses of force. And when you change a policy like that, then yeah, they're going to go up exponentially. Um, Nothing's changed in your agency, except for there's a policy in place that forces you to report more. Um, And so then, yeah. And then the news, they, they don't do that deep dive. They just look and say, Oh shoot. You know, it was only 50 last year and now it's 250. Right. So, yeah. Well, Brian, I uh, respect and admire the fact that that we're all alike, that we came from the dispatch world and into the law enforcement world. I appreciate the phone call. This was a great uh, phone call. I want you to leave us uh, more v- uh, voicemails, or, but better yet, listen and, and tell six of your friends and have them leave us that rating and review. I appreciate you calling. Take care, brother. Um, unless you have Absolutely. I, uh, uh, before I go, I, I, I loved your guys take on Memphis. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. I won't say anything else. Uh, I do, I do agree hundred percent with what you guys said. It was absolutely disgusting to watch. Um, and it's, you know, a detriment to good police officers across the nation. It, it is. And, and I think anybody that trolls social media or, or spends any amount of time on social media or, or way too much time on social media, if you're me, uh, I think you'll see that Brian and John and, and even Eric, and I, I think we all share the same opinion about it. There, there's probably maybe 0.00001% that don't. And there's even some celebrities that have kind of shocked me that, you know, they're still playing this resistance line and, and that's fine. I mean, it's just, it's a difference of opinion between, um, you know, what I see and what they see or whatever. Um, I, I, I personally don't think he was resisting. I think he was trying to get away because he knew what was coming if he yeah. quote just complied, but, uh, that's a whole different topic for another, for another day. Thank you again for calling, uh, Brian. Absolutely. I want, I, I'm hoping you'll call back. Appreciate it. I would definitely will. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Love everything. Uh, and I'm a big fan of the new addition to the show. <laughs> That's great. Take Thanks, care. I like it too. Well, with that, I don't know that we can top anything else. Uh, just no. do, do yourself a favor. Don't be a dummy pants. Always keep your flagpole, uh, illuminated. And, uh, from, uh, the bottom of my socks and from John's beard, I am wishing you a bond farewell. John, stick around. Everybody loves everybody. I have to get yelled at after this show, guys. It's every week. It's all right. Yes. And we're going to write uh, the order of secession three times. Okay. Gosh. <laughs>